Um, I wanted to ask you all, uh, one of my favorite parts of any conference is all the posters. And just because I always think about the case of Timothy Ray Brown, that it was first introduced to the world on a, I'm gonna call it a lousy looking poster. It was just a typical poster that if you don't understand science, you would just walk by it and not even realize what it was. And I think a lot of people didn't really catch it at first that way. But um, with the poster selection this year, is there anything that you found that stood out? Do you have a favorite poster that uh, had some impact on your, your thinking or your work or your ideas about cure? So there was a poster from the Oxford group that looked at the correlates of uh, lack of rebound on treatment interruption. And, and there was actually quite a bit on this theme in the conference as well, as far as biomarkers and, 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 and products that could be measured that would be predictive of what would happen. And um, so they basically described that if you have a particular gene signature that you would have a predicted longer period of uh, lack of viral return. So that's kind of cool. But the intriguing part is that the signature was related to a, a particular program of interferon mediated regulation, which is this sort of response of your innate immune system that you would be engaging. Now, the reason it's intriguing is that we also had another presentation from a, 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 another group that basically were describing how this same type of signature, if it's present during the viral rebound, basically allows the virus to break through it, meaning that it's not gonna stop it. Mm -hmm. So then the question is, how come the signature on antiretroviral therapy would predict longer time if this other work is showing that the virus can break through that without any problem. Because you would argue that it wouldn't necessarily be the breaks, right? So so the, the reason I thought that was interesting is that when you think about this gene signature, you can think of it in two ways. One is what it's doing to the cell that is being infected. And the other is what it's doing to the immune system and if you just look at it from the point of view of the cell that it has been infected, then the other work says there's no nothing to gain here because they're showing the virus can break through, that it can infect the cell in spite of this particular program. Hmm. But if you look at it from the immune side, then you would argue, is this program making the immune system more powerful? even if the virus can break through it anyway, if it was to infect the cell without an immune system. So, and the reason that's kind of cool is that a lot of the cure strategies are looking to modulate the immune system directly, not necessarily the cell that is being infected. Right. So, so this would suggest that there is hope in strategies that are looking to promote this type of response going into a treatment interruption. If we, kind of put the two studies together. And this was a, a poster from a group at Oxford that described that. Hmm. Great. Um, Anne, how about you? Any posters you want to care? Tell me about? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that the way they did the posters was actually kind of nice. They, they called them science spotlights and basically people got about five minutes to talk through them. So they were sort of like mini talks um, in a way. Um, so, I guess one, I mean, there, there were a lot. I mean, I think a lot of the science was presented as, as spotlights here, but um, one that I thought was interesting that's not uh, sort of directly cure related, I suppose, but has some relevance is that um, there was a study from um, Allison Thomas at Boston University School of Medicine, and they were looking at um, a type of antibody response called antibody dependent cellular cytotoxicity in, um, in infants who were um, HIV exposed but uninfected compared to HIV exposed and infected. Um, and they found that the uninfected infants had much higher levels of um, anti a this ADCC activity uh, than the infected infants. Now, of course, they can't prove that having higher levels of ADCC um, protected those uninfected infants, but it's kind of intriguing. Um, 
and the they then for the babies who were infected, they segregated them into those that had high ADCC and those that had low ADCC. And the ones that had the higher levels had um, kind of better outcomes. So fewer kind of adverse events and, and less death um, was associated. And these are kind of old samples that were stored from the, what's something called the BAN study that was actually looking at kind of breastfeeding um, in terms of transmission. But that was interesting because um, it, we have a study from my group that was um, presented as a uh, partially presented as an oral abstract and then partially presented as a science spotlight where we have a group of um, infant rhesus macaques that were infected with um, simian human immunodeficiency virus and they we infected them at multiple different time points or no we infected them sort of around four weeks of age and then we started antiretroviral therapy at multiple different time points. So uh, very early, just within a few days after infection, a couple of weeks after infection, and then two months after infection. And so there was no additional intervention. But the idea was to kind of um, treat them for a year and then interrupt therapy and allow for rebound to occur so, so that we could have um, varying times to rebound, varying post-treatment control and could try to generate an, like sort of a whole uh, biomarker stew that we could use to predict sort of what are those rebound characteristics. And that whole uh, idea of this is that you could use um, the, inf the information that we're getting from the non-human primate model to try to inform when it would be safe and appropriate to do treatment interruption in children. Um, mm -hmm. in your trial. So that's the whole idea behind the study in the first place. And But one of the things that we found, and it's just an N of one monkey for now, so it's not something that, you know, we are, you know, we need to definitely see if it's, if it's relevant in other cohorts. But we had one animal that uh, did not rebound. Mm. And the strongest predictor of that was um, autologous uh, antibody responses that developed while the animal was on antiretroviral therapy. Um, and they were neutralizing for that animal's own virus. Um, and we're looking into other antibody functions like ADCC in this animal as well. So it seems like maybe the humoral immunity is playing a role. Um, and, and that's been, so there's some other evidence, I think from Janet Silicano presented at uh, the Strategies for a Cure meeting, um, some information about autologous neutralizing antibodies and, and their role in, in rebound as well. So that's sort of um, something that we're pursuing. No, that's great. Yeah. Um, and uh, Mark, I see that you have your hand raised, um, but I wanted to give Lewis a chance to respond to my poster question first. So if you could hold tight, we'll get Lewis to talk and then Mark will get your question, okay? So Lewis. Oh, I did. I, I told about oh, the did. Oxford Oxford oh, poster. Uh, Brad, I'm sorry. Brad, I messed up. <laughs> Brad it's you. <laughs> yeah, no problem. So, Brad. so, hello. Um, so, I agree. The poster sessions were really interesting. Actually, a lot of the things that I highlighted so far were from the science spotlights or, or posters. But I'll highlight um, one more that I thought was pretty neat. This was from Nicholas Chamont's group, um, which presented a test of this. Uh, the so-called fill and replace strategy to reduce the reservoir. And the idea here is that you use a growth factor to stimulate um, the thymus to make new T cells. So the thymus is the organ in the body that makes T cells. So you can just essentially, the idea is make new T cells. They're not infected. They don't have a reservoir. And this just kind of pushes the other, the other uh, T cells out of the way over, over time. And uh, so they report that when they give this, this was a, a, a trial, a clinical trial, they report that when they, they give this growth factor, they do see evidence for an increase in new T cells. And as a result of this, there is a, a modest, but statistically significant decrease in the frequency of cells with HIV DNA. So. So uh, a, a small proportional reduction in the reservoir, 0.8 fold uh, change. So I think, you know, early, early days for this strategy, but uh, kind of neat and something to uh, keep an eye on. Wow, that's cool. Thank you. And uh, if you didn't see in the chat there, Richard Jeffries was informing us that the Croy Conference has trademarked science spotlights. Hmm. I know that's uh, interesting news. I just thought that would, I would point that out to people if they hadn't seen it. <laughs> Definitely worth highlighting. 